The major epidemic of SARS-CoV-2, also known as COVID-19, continues to ravage the world. In this video, I hope to give you a background on the virus. The hope is with accurate information, you can make good decisions for you and your family. The video will cover the origins of the virus, the viral structure, its replication, symptoms of the disease, and finally treatments. Let's begin. There is significant controversy about whether animals in the seafood market in Wuhan, China were the source of this epidemic, or whether a person ill with the virus went to the market and increased its spread. The first case was diagnosed on December 1st in China and had no apparent link to the market. There were another 13 out of the initial 41 cases that could not be linked to the market. So it really seems like this virus jumped to somebody who then went to this market where there are a lot of people and then it spread from there. In just a few months, the virus has since spread around the world. SARS-CoV-2 is an envelope virus with a positive single-stranded RNA genome. The membrane is decorated with a number of proteins with the spike glycoprotein probably being the most important for immunity. The prominent spike proteins give the virus the appearance of a solar corona, hence the name of this virus family. This virus family has been around for years, but most of the time they just cause simple colds. It's only in the last decade or so that we've started to get these severe lower respiratory infections, and SARS-CoV-2 is the first one that's caused a global pandemic. The SARS-CoV-2 genome is 30,000 base pairs long and it is an RNA virus, and this is very large for an RNA virus. The first two genes, ORF1A and ORF1B, encode the polyproteins which make parts of the replicase. The large RNA replicase is unusual in that it encodes a 3' exonuclease, which is a proofreading activity. So when it copies its genome, it is actually able to go back and fix mistakes. This is probably necessary because of the large genome. If it didn't have that proofreading capability, you'd never make a successful copy of the virus. This also means that this RNA virus does not mutate as rapidly as other RNA viruses. The spike E and M proteins may serve as targets for the immune response. SARS-CoV-2 replication. SARS-CoV-2 inner cells by attaching to the ACE2 the angiotensin converting enzyme 2 receptor. These receptors are common on epithelial cells that line the lung, heart, kidney, brain, and gut, thus accounting for the targets of the virus. Once the SARS-CoV-2 binds, the virus is taken into the cell by the endocytotic pathway. Entry of the virus into the cytoplasm is dependent upon acidification of the endosome, which involves the spike protein cleavage and a conformational change. A membrane fusion between the viral envelope and the endosome occurs and the nucleocapsid then enters the cytoplasm. After entry of the single-stranded RNA into the cytoplasm, it heads to the ribosome. The viral genome has a 5' cap and a poly A tail, so it looks like a messenger RNA. Because of this, it is recognized by the ribosome and translated into a large polyprotein. The polyprotein is degraded by viral proteases into the replication enzyme and other non-structural proteins, or NSPs. The replicase makes subgenomic and genomic RNA. The subgenomic RNA serves as mRNAs for various other proteins. The structural proteins are translated at the endoplasmic reticulum and are glycolated at the Golgi apparatus. What that means is these proteins that are translated this way E, M, and S go through this normal export pathway in the cell. They then have sugars that decorate them, put on by the Golgi apparatus, and they end up in a membrane. Full-length RNA, nucleocapsid protein, then bind to vesicles containing viral envelope proteins, N, M, and E, facilitate this interaction. The fully formed virion then exits the cell by exocytosis. So that's the replication cycle. 
It's pretty typical for an RNA virus, except again, one of the notable things about this virus is it has this large genome and then it has a replicase that proofreads. Symptoms of illness appear two to 14 days after exposure. An early warning sign is a loss of smell. Sufferers can experience fever, cough, shortness of breath, fatigue, and body aches. The illness typically runs its course in two weeks, but infected individuals can shun virus for up to 22 days. A serious trait of this disease is the occurrence of asymptomatic carriers, which make up 25% of patients, at least that's what the latest research is showing. It's not yet clear how many of these eventually go on to show symptoms and how many just recover and never know they have the disease. The majority of cases of SARS-CoV-2 are mild, with 80% never progressing to severe illness. In severe cases, pre-existing conditions decrease survival. The CDC examined data from reports of 2,449 patients. Of these, 508 required hospitalization, and the outcomes in these patients appear in the chart. Note that the rate of hospitalization is significant for all age groups above 20 you can see that there were a number of hospitalizations and they were found in everyone in the age groups. You also see that deaths though were lower in the younger age groups and increased over time. One thing to note about this is it doesn't seem to be age so much as the accumulation of pre-existing conditions and you can see what the death rates are for the various conditions that were talked about heart disease diabetes chronic respiratory disease etc however even if you don't have any pre-existing conditions your risks of death after infection are 0.9 percent there are a number of potential treatments for infections with SARS-CoV-2 endosome fusion requires acidification of the endosome and this enables S protein cleavage and drugs that inhibit acidification, such as chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine, have found success in blocking the virus, both in cell culture and in early clinical trials. Current trials have been small and have had significant design flaws. However, more investigation is warranted and ongoing, and a study was just released by WHO, which I'll mention in a second. Protease inhibitors such as loponavir, developed for HIV, another RNA virus, along with ritonavir, have also been tried without much success. Interferon beta has shown cl clinical effectiveness against other coronaviruses and was also being tested against SARS-CoV-2. Finally, RNA replicase inhibitors such as remdesivir, originally developed as a treatment for Ebola, have found success in treating SARS-CoV-2. Results of the clinical trial show how hydroxychloroquine and loponavir ritonavir are not effective against this virus. As more work has been done, these two have been shown not to be effective. In early studies released in the spring of this year, remdesivir seemed to show some success in stopping the virus. The time to recovery was decreased from 15 to 11 days, and the mortality rate was decreased from 11% in the control group to 8% in the test group. However, the WHO did a very large study looking at all of these drugs in all the different treatments for uh, this coronavirus infectious infections and they showed no significant benefit of any of these drugs. On a more positive note, monoclonal antibodies in convalescent plasma, which both create and will identify the SARS virus in a person and activate its immune system against it have shown success if used early. President Trump and Ben Carson both got this treatment and it seemed to turn around their prognosis. Also steroids that mitigate the immune response such as dexamethasone and prednisone have been shown to decrease the risk of the need for ventilation and decrease the risk of death in patients up to 75%. So these seem to be quite effective. Vaccine candidates for SARS-CoV-2 are under development. 
SARS-CoV-2 is a good candidate for a vaccine as it has a prominent immunologically active protein, the spike protein, and it mutates slowly, especially in comparison to other RNA viruses. At the present time, there, were 50, there are 52 vaccines in testing. The fastest to trial are two RNA vaccines. In these cases, an RNA that encodes a viral protein is injected into patients. The protein is translated at the ribosome and produces the viral protein. This then gets displayed on the surface of the cell where the RNA was made and it mimics a viral infection and elicits an immune response. Component vaccines based upon proteins or parts of proteins of the virus, often the spike protein, are also under development. Also, whole viral vaccines are under development. A potential advantage of the RNA slash DNA vaccines if successful is the ability to quickly ramp up production and create enough doses to protect the general public. Moderna, the maker of an RNA vaccine is undergoing clinical trials, hopes to make it available to healthcare workers by fall. And the good news is, as of the first week of November, the world got spectacular news. The mRNA vaccines from Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna are spectacularly effective. The Pfizer BioNTech N vaccine showed a 95% efficacy in their combined phase 2 3 trials of over 40,000 page participants. They reported 170 infections, with all but eight of them in the control group. So the vaccine clearly was protective. There were 10 severe cases, and all but one of them was in the control group. The Moderna vaccine was just as effective. In their 30,000 patient cohort, 95 cases were reported, 90 in the control group, and only five in the test group. All severe cases of COVID-19 were in the control group. The low incidence of severe cases is also a great sign, indicating not only does the vaccine protect against disease, if you do get sick, you are far less likely to get severe illness. The AstraZeneca vaccine is also just as effective, with one dosing protocol giving 90% efficacy. This vaccine has an advantage of being able to be stored at refrigeration temperatures. The Pfizer vaccine requires very cold temperatures for it to remain stable, and the Moderna vaccine also requires it to be frozen and under distribution. Stopping the pandemic is now a solvable distribution problem. How willing is the world population to be vaccinated? A recent Gallup survey showed that 58% of Americans would be willing to get the vaccine when it becomes available. While this number is lower than I would like, I expect that number to climb as education campaigns ramp up and the vaccination begins. Appreciate the significance of this moment and celebrate it. In less than a year, the world scientific community identified this virus figured out how to develop a vaccine, and tested this vaccine against the worst global infectious disease threat we have faced in 100 years. That is amazing. Hooray for science nerds. So what can you do? The most important thing you can do to help society and yourself in general is social distancing. When your health authorities ask you to social distance, do it. Slowing the spread of SARS-CoV-2 keeps the number of infected patients low enough that we do not overwhelm our healthcare system. This is essential as it means we have enough resources to care for the sickest individuals and pull them through the crisis period of the disease. Secondly, wear a mask. This isn't for your protection. It is for the protection of others. The latest research is showing that while most transmission appears to be close contact, there is a significant chance of transmission via aerosols and droplets. If you are infected, a mask will greatly decrease the amount of aerosols and droplets that you're sending out into the environment and decrease the rate of, of infection. Third, keep your immune system healthy. There are a number of behaviors that have been shown to keep your immune system in peak condition. Get enough sleep. Eat a well-balanced diet with roots and veggies. Don't smoke, drink moderately, if at all, and try to minimize stress. Yes, I know in these times that is going to be tough. Another thing that you can do is fight misinformation. I now charge you with this task. 
students in this class know more than 95% of the population about microbiology and disease. Use your knowledge to inform others and fight back strongly against the misinformation. You don't have to be rude, but don't let incorrect information that you run across go unchallenged. For example, one of the myths that's going around is this is a, China, a virus that was engineered by the Chinese. It is not. Also, other people are saying it's not as bad as the health experts are saying. It is. So spend some time challenging people that tell you that and inform them that it's incorrect. Let me finish this video by letting you know that we will get through this together. A death rate of 1% is horrific and will result in the loss of hundreds of thousands of lives just in the United States. Many of us will lose someone we know or love because of this virus. However, that also means that 99% of people who get infected will recover. In addition, I'm inspired by the work that has been done by the human population. Never before has the global community worked so well together to prevent the rate of spread of a pandemic. New therapeutics and vaccines have been developed in record time and eventually they will bring an end to this disease. Be thankful for the doctors, nurses, and scientists that are on the front lines of this pandemic, but also for the grocers, the farmers, the truck drivers, the teachers, the janitors, and all other social personnel that are keeping our world running. Never forget their contributions they made.